Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. <laughs> Welcome to Two Rivers Assembly one more time. Hey, I'm Will Hampton. I'm the lead pastor here. And we have been walking through the last couple of weeks about in the God at the Movie series talking about relationship killers and learning and discovering ways that we can come to the Word of God and how God changes and God has a plan for our relationships. And so as we put the principles of the Word of God to practice in our life, the Bible says that our relationships will be blessed. And that in those relationships, as we begin to deal with the things that, God, that come to us in those relationships, that God will change our lives. So the first two weeks we talked about conflict and resolving conflict and how that some of us, when we get into conflict, we like to fight. We, we, we did the Avengers movie and how in that moment we are to be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. And then last week we talked about the flight response. That flight is sometimes good when you're being chased by the Terminator, it's time to go. Right? Don't stand and fight the Terminator, it's a good plan to run. But in relationships it's never a good plan to run. That no matter, every time we avoid the conflict, every time that we shove it aside, it just continues to build up. And the Bible says it this way, in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. There is a God-given process for resolving conflict. This week is all about expectations. So if, if we talked about resolving conflict, one of the ways to do that is to eliminate the conflict that comes into our relationships. And one of the greatest sources of conflict in our relationships has to do with expectations. Everybody say expectations. expectations. Now turn to your neighbor and tell them, you are wearing the wrong clothes for church. You are wearing the wrong clothes for church. Oh, man, I tell you what, I, that was one of the most, uh, like, interesting questions I get. Like, what am I supposed to wear to go to church? Yes, wear a suit and tie. Wear, go, go to the store and buy something else, and then you'll be allowed to come in because you look the right way. No, that's not how we teach it here at Two Rivers. Uh, we, talk, we talk about here dealing with expectations for going to church. Everybody has an idea of what's supposed to go on at church. Everybody has an idea of what this thing should be all about. And, and so our expectation of church really radically impacts what we receive from going to church. Sometimes, I, I remember as a kid growing up, I would go to this thing called teen camp. And my expectation for teen camp was that God was going to just come and wreck my life. I didn't have that same expectation on Sunday. And guess what I got on Sunday? I didn't get God. When I went to teen camp, guess what I got? God. So I, expectations in our life can determine they can be a great blessing. High expectations for our kids, they live up to them. Put low expectations on our kids. Tell, tell Parents, tell your kids that they're stupid. Go do that today. It's It's wonderful. What, what will happen in their life? If you don't know me yet, I'm joking. <laughs> All right? Don't go tell your kids they're stupid because what will happen? They'll live into that expectation. They'll live into what, what we put on their life. And so expectations have the power in relationships to create beautiful things. If you tell your kid, son, I believe you're smart. I, I expect you to come home with A's. That can be a wonderful expectation, but the flip side of that is that could be death <laughs> on that child. Because they're always trying to live up to that expectation. They're always trying to be good enough, to be enough, to make it, and, and they fall short. Well, <clears throat> I want us to look at how expectations influence and impact relationships. You know, when, when you're dating, the whole time you're dating, you're trying to get to know somebody. You're trying to get to know how you're the same. Oh, she likes ice cream. I like ice cream. <laughs> she likes to go to movies. I like to go to movies. This is wonderful. I think we're made for each other. <laughs> this is it. She's the one. 
She likes purple. I don't know anyone that likes purple but her. I like purple. And the next thing you know, you have designed this whole thing for what it takes. Oh, you've spent this whole dating relationship getting to know that person. And then you get married. And you spend the rest of your life, instead of discovering how you're alike, you spend the rest of your life discovering how you're different. <laughs> Right? That's every relationship. Look, you start the beginning of the relationship. I'm getting to know how we're the same because I need to know if we're compatible. I need to know if we can fit together. And, and, and so we start building these expectations for because, oh, we're the same, we're the same, we're the same. And then all of a sudden you get married and you discover, or you've been in a relationship for a long time, and, and you discover, guys, how many of you, think that your wives absolutely think the temperature it need it way too hot in the winter time <laughs> like like i'm trying to take blankets off take the blanket off get don't put your leg on me but it's too hot this is way too hot in here and the temperature is 95 degrees and she's shivering how can you be shivering it's hotter in the house than your body temperature right and so so you have these weird expectations you just discovered over time. Hot and cold are different. On time and late. Some people are on time people. I want, in fact, I had a coach that told us if we weren't 10 minutes early, we were late. I thought, man, I don't think you understand how on time and late work. Because we had a saying called Hampton time growing up. We were consistently late. I don't know why, whatever the reason, it was just we walked in, and it was if it started at 10, we probably walked in at 10.05 or 10.10, whatever. We were busy being productive, doing other things. And, and so when you get into a relationship, there's an on-time person, and then there's the late person. And then there's time estimates that go along with that. How many have said, oh, honey, how long do you think it's going to take you to get ready? <laughs> It could be an hour, it could be an hour and a half. I don't know. I am an overestimator. I'm like, I'm going to underestimate the amount of time. Oh, I could probably get ready in like three minutes. My wife would be like, it's an hour and a half. And, and so there's, there's some communication differences when you start thinking about, okay, and, 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 it, and that makes a big difference. How many know there's a problem when you squeeze the toothpaste? <laughs> I am a back squeezer. My wife is a front squeezer. This is ruining the toothpaste tube. You cannot maximize the amount of toothpaste when you squeeze from the front. You're sending it to the back. It's counterproductive. Toilet paper. Are you a top roller or a bottom feeder? Which one? Right? Look, these things are all cute when you first start dating. Oh, it's cute. He's a top roller. And then she puts it on the bottom. That's not how it goes. That's not how it's supposed to be. I, I, I've probably told this story before, but in, when Crystal and I first got married, I, she had her dreams, so she was going to be the Susie homemaker, do everything perfectly in the house. I was going to take care of everything outdoors, mow, take care of the garbage, do the, do the, you know, all the outdoor stuff. And she was doing my laundry, but she was folding it wrong. I fold this way, she folded that way. I took it upon myself to tell her she was folding it wrong. Nobody warned me. All right? Her response was really clever. It was really clever. She said, if you want your folded laundry folded that way, okay, you can do it yourself. I said, I said fine. I'm a grown man. I can do my own laundry. I don't need you. And, and, and so that's what happens in relationships. 
all of these expectations. And, and what happens is at the beginning, it's okay, right? It's okay to, that there's differences and all of those things. Are, it's like how you handle the finances and how I handle the finances. They might be different. And, and we just walk, we skip along merrily because, hey, it's Hollywood, right? We all have this, this dream, this expectation. We've all watched television about how relationships should be. And we've watched all the movies. And Disney said that when you get married and, and you get together, then it's happily ever after, <laughs> dot, dot, dot. And how many of you know that Hollywood has presented unreal expectations right. that our dreams and what we bring into relationships and how we think things are going to function are not realistic yeah. and 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 so as we uh, begin to deal with some of these differences and in, in how that works it, it becomes this this thing where how we handle the expectations can either kill the relationship or it can bring life to the relationship. It's, it's all in how we navigate those expectations, but that's really tricky. And, and so as we start out, everything seems to be okay, but as the relationship progresses, as time goes on, we start discovering not how much we're the same, we start discovering how much we are different. And before you know it, we've become like Lord Business in the Lego movie. Let's watch this clip and see how Lord Business handles his expectations. Deadly. Activate helmet. Light sequence. Flame test. Engage dramatic entrance. Badcock. Lord Business, I know the special got away, but don't be so serious. Where's the other guy? Hey, hey, buddy. I missed you. Oh, did you really? Have I ever shown you my relic collection? Nope. I don't think you have. Nobody knows where this stuff comes from. This one is the cloak of Bandai. I hear it's super painful to take off. You want to try it on? Well, uh... No, but thank you. We've done some great work over the years together, Bad Cop. Capturing all those master builders and torturing them and whatnot. Thank you, sir. Although, you did let the piece of resistance go, the one thing that can ruin my plans, the one thing that I asked you to take care of. <laughs> That's super frustrating. It makes me just want to pick up whoever is standing closest to me and just throw them through this window and out into the infinite abyss of nothingness. <laughs> I want to do it so bad. <laughs> I know you do. <laughs> please, please don't. And it's not just you, bad cop, that keeps messing up my plans. People everywhere are always messing with my stuff. But I have a way to fix that. A way to keep things exactly the way they are supposed to be. Permanently. Behold, the most powerful weapon of all the relics. The Fraggle! <laughs> As you can see, they're loading the craggle in a big machine upstairs. I call it the Tentacle Arm Craggle Outside Sprayer, or TACO. The S is silent. So on TACO Tuesday, it's going to spray the craggle over everyone and everything with a bunch of super scary nozzles like this one. I'll show you how it works. Sir, I don't know that this is necessary. Oh, don't worry. I won't test it on you. I'll do it on your parents. What? Hiya, son. Hi. How's it going in the big city? Mommy, Daddy, what are you doing here? Okay, Pa, I just want you to act naturally, like you're, you're going about your day. Gotcha. Yeah, keep your hand up like that. Ma, scoot two steps into the right. Pa, uh -huh. why do, whenever I talk to Ma, you start to move. Oh, sorry. Get back to where you were. Here. Perfect. That's great. You can't do anything better. There's no reason why you should move. Right. Now, Ma, hand on his shoulder, and you... Pa, you just moved in. You just wrecked it. Wrecked it! Bad cop. You see what I'm talking about? All I'm asking for is total perfection. <laughs> so, that's, uh, that's how we become at some point. Because in our relationships, we're saying, oh, I want it this way, I want it this way, I want it this way. And at some point, we're asking for total perfection out of that person we're in relationship with. 
And, and so how we manage those expectations creates either room for us to breathe or it chokes the life out of those we're in relationship with. You know, it's interesting because I think about his Lord Business and, and his demand for perfection and his demand. And I wonder if somehow that's how we view God. And that God is just upstairs and he's saying, stand this way, do this, don't move. Hey, every time I tell you, don't move. And, and every time he looks back and I'm just a screw up and God looks at me and he sees me as a mess and he sees me as somebody who doesn't, doesn't have it all together. And, and he just wants to kick me out and send me down into the abyss. And, and so what we have to do is we have to understand who God is. Is God like Lord Business? Is that what his expectation is for us? Is that how God views us and wants us to live our life? And I think the answer to that is no. And I think the answer to that is found in the person of Jesus Christ. That all the answers to our expectations for each other, for what happens in how we raise children, for what happens in how we handle our finances, for, for how we approach work, for how we, how we handle our friends and our preferences, for all of how all those things fit together and what that all looks like in your life and my life, are all impacted by the person of Jesus. Right. And, and so what I want us to do is I want us to discover Christ-centered relationships. You see, in, in a natural relationship, in, in most relationships, your expectations and my expectations can be totally different. And the problem lies in that who's going to give way? Who's going who's to create room for the other person? Who's going to surrender their thing so that the other person can have their thing? Who gets to make decisions about finances? Who gets to make decisions about how the children are raised? Who gets to decide those things? And, and what happens is at, over time, those things become a tremendous source of conflict. And those things become a power struggle. Fortunately for us, God didn't leave us without a pattern. God didn't leave us without instruction for how we should handle that type of conflict, that type of expectation. God has a blueprint for your relationship. Go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 31 through 33. Paul is laying down instructions for godly households. He's saying, hey, in, in a Christian household, this is how we should live. This is how we should behave. And, and so this is what Paul says about how relationships work. For this reason, a man will leave. Everyone say leave. Leave. His father and mother, and be united, everyone say united, united, to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. And then he says, this is a profound mystery, but I'm not talking about Christ and the church. However, each of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. So, I... I just, I love this. I love this because this is God's blueprint for how a relationship should work. And, and what Paul is saying here is this. It's a little bit cryptic, but he says, this is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ in the church. So Paul talks about two different relationships in this verse. He talks about, first and foremost, he's talking about our relationship with Jesus Christ and then he's talking about our relationship with others. It's more specifically the person that you're going to marry. The person that you are trying to build a life with. And, and, and so what Paul says is first, Jesus Christ is the head. And, and so I want us to look at this little diagram and it, it kind of explains the way, the game plan for what a Christ-centered relationship looks like. Simply, Jesus is at the top. And, and then you have woman and man. 
in, in the way God intends for this relationship to work, if we have a Christ-centered relationship, everybody say Christ-centered, Christ is that the man and the woman are both under the lordship of Jesus Christ. And when I say lordship, that's a really unusual term for us to hear. Because lordship is talking about who gets to make decisions. See, lordship in a Christ-centered relationship, Jesus is the one who's setting forth the decisions in our relationships. So your expectations and my expectations all of a sudden come under the lordship of Jesus Christ. And the person that gets to decide who gets to put the toilet paper on top and who gets to have it come under the bottom is Jesus. <laughs> All right? So we'll explain how Jesus makes that happen in our relationships here in a second. Wait, I have been praying and I haven't heard any direction from God about which end of the toilet paper it should come up. <clears throat> There's fortunately a, a process for how this is expressed in our relationships. But the reality of it is this. God's intention for your life, for my life, for our relationships, is that Jesus be the center of our relationship. It doesn't say that we have church-centered relationships. It doesn't say that we would have religious-centered relationships. It doesn't say that I would have a me-centered relationship. It is that we are to have a Christ-centered relationship relationship. Jesus being the head. And, and this is really interesting because if you look at the arrows, there is a divine flow that's happening between Jesus and man. That as I come to Jesus, I get filled up. And that as I come to Christ, then I can come to my wife and give. And, and as she goes to Jesus, she gets filled up. And that as she comes to me, she can give. How often in relationships it is that we are trying to get from our relationship. We're trying to get from the person that we are in relationship with. I need him to do this. I need him to do that. I need her to do this. I need her to do that. All of our expectations are placed upon them to fulfill us. Yeah. And it does not work unless we come to Christ first. And begin to get filled up in Jesus. And then as we come back into that relationship, we have something to give. You cannot give what you do not have. And you cannot get from them what they do not have. And what's interesting is that it's not that the only divine flow is between God. It's not just vertical, it's horizontal. That as we are in relationship with Jesus, it allows us to be more effectively in relationship with each other. That as I get from God the goodness and the gift that he intends me to be, I can be the gift to my wife that he intends me to be. And that's the picture of Christ-centered relationships. So here's what I want everyone to hear. Learn together to set your hopes and dreams in the, in the relationship on Jesus Christ. So what this means is that as you are putting your hopes and dreams into Jesus, it begins to redefine what your expectations are for each other. Jesus becomes the Lord. All of a sudden, I'm not. My expectations have to become surrendered to Christ. And, and so that's where we get to in, in this cycle, this pattern. Jesus, I had you kind of say these words out loud. Out loud. In order for us to have Christ-centered relationships and Christ-centered expectations, the first step is leave. Everybody say leave. leave. The man leaves his father and mother. Where do we get all of our expectations from? We grew up in it. You grew up watching mom and dad or what, either there was something there or there wasn't something there, but you predefined it by your experiences from the past. 
And you've made decisions about how you think relationships should be. From, because you've watched mom and dad, you've watched television, you've seen people in relationships. And, and the Bible says that we have to leave those things behind. And what happens is as you leave those things behind, it creates space. See, if I'm over here, and if you were to imagine that this is a wall here, the further I get from the wall, the more room there is, the more space there is for the relationship to grow. And, and so we have to leave those expectations behind, and, and we have to understand that it is a journey. There's a journey that we're walking on to, to move and progress and, and, and develop, and that's something that happens over time. That as we leave these things behind, it creates room. And it, it, what happens is it creates grace in our life. See, Christ-centered relationship isn't just that Jesus is Lord. But in Jesus' lordship over our life, God demonstrated his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He forgave us. He gave us room to grow. That's why I know that your business is nothing like God. Because God has high expectations. But in that high expectation, he provides for us the room to fail and the room to grow and the power and the strength to accomplish it. Yeah. And God's expectation isn't self-centered. If you read Romans chapter 5 and it talks about the Ten Commandments and the law, it says that the law was intended to bring life. That's right. That we have somehow misrepresented what the law should be doing in our life. And we say, oh, God doesn't want me to lie. I should be able to lie anytime I want to lie. That's great as long as you want to bring death into your relationships. Amen. As long as you want to lie, that's fine. But it's not going to produce life. It's not going to produce wholeness. It's not going to produce health. And so God's intention for you is better than you ever imagined. And, and so as we discover Jesus, we discover that he freely gives us grace and forgiveness, even in the worst of our mistakes. And in a Christ-centered relationship, somebody is messing with your toilet paper. <laughs> and, it, and, and we have to, because of Jesus Christ, forgive. And that sounds silly when we talk about toilet paper, but it's not really silly when we start talking about expectations sexually. It's not very silly when we start talking about expectations for how we handle finances. And it's not very silly when we start talking about how we would handle our expectations for raising our children. Tremendous room for conflict. Tremendous room for all of those things to really derail us. But if Jesus is the center... Those times that we say, oh, you fell short of my expectation. We discover that he gives us room to fail. He gives us space to grow. And we extend that to the people that we are in relationship because we have received forgiveness freely from Jesus. Go and do likewise. Amen. So the question is, what do we need to leave behind? In our expectations, what do we need to leave behind? Number two is this idea that we would join together instead of the, what the verse says. I like to say cleave. Old school. That's right. It's, it's way more cooler to say leave and cleave than it is to say that we would uh, be united. Leave united. I don't know. Cleave sounds more fun. So... So go look it up in the dictionary. It's an awesome word. What it means is coming together. It's joining together. If we're leaving something, we're not going in a destination all by ourselves. We're leaving to cleave. We're leaving to join together. And, and so in that space, in, you like that? Let's do this. Everybody do that. Yeah. yeah. Cleave. That's now, I, I talked to somebody one time, and they said that they thought cleave meant that you got out a cleaver and then, like, chopped stuff, and they were trying to figure out what that verse talked about. And so um, that, that could be an interesting approach to a Christ-centered relationship. I leave, and then I cleave the relationship. Yes. No. 
That's not how it works. So this is what it means to cleave. As we cleave, we talk to each other and submit to one another out of love. And, and so this is an amazing word, submit. Everybody say submit. Submit. This is, this is it right here. This is the Christ-centered relationship because as we submit to Christ, as we are submitting in our relationship flow, in the Christ-centered flow, I come under the Lordship of Jesus. You know who else I come under submission to? I come under submission to my wife. I submit to my wife. And what's amazing is that as she is submitting to Jesus, she is coming under submission to me. Submission has been made into a dirty word, but it's the most beautiful, amazing plan that God ever intended for our relationships. Good. And, and, and God puts an awesome twist on it because <clears throat> he says it this way. At the end of the verse in Ephesians, he says, However, each of you must also love his wife as he loves himself. This is awesome because you know what women want? For the most part, women want love. Now, why, look, how, how, why do you think relationship romance movies are so popular for women? Right? I don't know a lot of guys that are into watching that. It could happen. It's not the end of the world. If a guy likes that, it's probably healthy. Right? Yeah. It's probably healthy if guys become more relationally oriented. <clears throat> but, but there's a core desire for a woman to be loved, right? Yeah. Look at what the man wants. Look, see, a, a woman might approach the man and say, Honey, I love you. He doesn't care about that. I want respect. It's good. Woo. I, look, look, a man does not want to come home after he has lost his job. Why? Why do you not want to come home? Because I want respect. I don't want my wife to look at me and think that I am anything less than what I am. And I would much rather have respect than I would have love. It's a core driving desire for men. And we have to understand that in relationships. And men, we have to understand that our spouse wants love. She wants love. She wants to be gathered together. And so Christ kind of predefines so how some of these expectations ought to function. And, and so as we become Christ-centered, it impacts how we relate together and how we surrender and how we cleave together and how we talk together. And, and, and when we get from God, it allows us to grow nearer to each other. And, and so here's, here's what I want to submit to you, that all the conflict and all the struggle that you have in your life, you can resolve that in a biblical way, but if you don't come under the lordship of Jesus Christ in your relationship and have Christ-centered expectations, that sex is always going to be a source of conflict. Money is always going to be a source of conflict. How you raise your kids will always be a source of conflict. What happens for your work, whether you work first or play first, will always be a source of conflict. Until... We establish the lordship of Jesus Christ in our relationships. Amen. Jesus sits at the center. He doesn't sit on the side. He's not something we involve in our life because we go to church on Sunday and then go home and do whatever we want to do. It does not work. It will not work for you to pray a prayer and say, Jesus, be Lord of my life, and then go and ignore God's plan. Amen. So here's the one thing that I want us to do as we close today. I want you to have a conversation with the people that you are in relationship with. It doesn't matter if it's husband and wife. I know I focused a lot of what we've talked about today for some type of marital relationship, but this can be with mother and son. This can be with grandma and, and grandchild. This can be in any of our relationships. God's intention is that we have Christ-centered relationship. And, and so I want you to have a conversation about having a Christ-centered relationship. Would you change your expectations for each other? This is so interesting that you would give each other permission to forgive each other. That you would be, give each other permission to forgive. 
you give each other permission to fail, that you would say, you know, some of these things that I've expected for your life maybe don't flow from Christ. Maybe I need to submit to you. Maybe, maybe, maybe I need to get right with God. Maybe I need to establish that relationship with God in the first place. And here as we begin to wrap this thing all up and we begin to put it all together, you can't have a Christ-centered relationship if you don't have a relationship with Jesus. And there's two things for you to have a relationship with Jesus. Leave, cleave. That we would leave behind our sin. Leave behind the crud that's destroying your life. Leave behind, out of your life, the stuff that is creating destruction. We hold on to it, though. We hold on to our pride. We hold on to those things. And what I want to invite you to do today, in a moment, we're going to have every head bowed and every eye closed. We're simply going to invite you to be into relationship with Jesus by leaving behind your way of doing things. The Bible talks about it with a word that says repent. That we would ask for forgiveness for our sins and turn and go another way. And then the second thing that happens is that we would cleave. We would be united with Christ and that we would come under his lordship. We would follow him and be in relationship with him for the rest of our days. With every head bowed, every eye closed, you're here today and you know that your source of conflict comes because you are not in right relationship with God and God's game plan says that Jesus has to be at the center. Today, if you're here and you are maybe feeling the Holy Spirit on your heart and on your life tugging you and drawing you, I want you to simply respond by raising your hand and saying, Pastor Will, I'm ready to make the decision to make Jesus Lord of my life. If you're here and you're ready to do that, raise your hand. I see hands going up all around the room. Anyone else? God bless you. God bless you. I see hands all up in the back, on all the sides, all around the room. Let's keep, put your hands down. We're going to do it this way. We're just going to pray this prayer all together. Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. I want to follow you. I want to do things your way. I'm making you Lord of my life because you died and rose again. You are the living God. I invite you into my life. I'll follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's give everybody that made that decision today a great big round of applause.